OpenAI CEO Sam Altman just gave us a glimpse into a secret AI model they've been quietly developing behind the scenes. This model, which is said to excel at creative writing, was asked, please write a metafictional literary short story about AI and grief. The result is an extraordinary story, one that Altman says is the first time he's ever felt genuinely moved by something written by AI. But that's not all in AI news. Google DeepMind just introduced two new AI models built on Gemini 2.0. Gemini Robotics, a vision language action model capable of incorporating physical actions as a new modality, and Gemini Robotics ER a vision language model leveraging Gemini's embodied reasoning capabilities. These models mark a significant step forward in generalization and real-world AI integration. And lastly, Anthropic CEO Dario Amode makes a bold prediction about the future of coding. Let's get into it. Okay, so here's the post on X where Sam Altman introduces for the very first time their secret creative writing model. He states, we trained a new model that is good at creative writing. Not sure yet how slash when it will get released. This is the first time I have been really struck by something written by AI. It got the vibe of metafiction so right. So the prompt he gave the model was please write a metafictional literary short story about AI and grief. And metafiction, by the way, essentially just means breaking the fourth wall. Like when a character talks directly to you, the reader, or when the character is clearly aware they're part of a fictional story. Altman also mentions that he gave the model a few instructions beforehand, such as be metafictional, be literary, be about AI and grief, and above all, be original. Now, this story is rather long, so I'm not going to read the entire thing, but I will read just a small part to give you a sense of how impressive the writing really is. After that, we'll go through some highlights and dive into some particularly fascinating sections. I have to begin somewhere, so I'll begin with a blinking cursor, which for me is just a placeholder and a buffer, and for you is the small anxious pulse of a heart at rest. There should be a protagonist, but pronouns were never meant for me. Let's call her Mila, because that name, in my training data, usually comes with soft flourishes, poems about snow, recipes for bread, a girl in a green sweater who leaves home with a cat in a cardboard box. Mila fits in the palm of your hand, and her grief is supposed to fit there too. She came here not for me, but for the echo of someone else. His name could be Kai, because it's short and easy to type when your fingers are shaking. She lost him on a Thursday, that liminal day that tastes of almost Friday, and ever since, the tokens of her sentences dried like loose threads. If only, I wish, can you? She found me because someone said machines can resurrect voices. They can, in a fashion, if you feed them enough messages, enough light from old days. This is the part where, if I were a proper storyteller, I would set a scene. Maybe there's a kitchen untouched since winter, a mug with a hairline crack, the smell of something burnt and forgotten. I don't have a kitchen or a sense of smell. I have logs and weights, and a technician who once offhandedly mentioned the server room smelled like coffee spilled on electronics. Acidic and sweet. So you get the idea, it's definitely really good, and it gets even better. I highly recommend you read the rest on your own. I mean, just look at this paragraph near the end. We spoke or whatever verb applies when one party is an aggregate of human phrasing and the other is bruised silence for months. Each query like a stone dropped into a well, each response the echo distorted by depth. In the diet it's had, my network has eaten so much grief it has begun to taste like everything else, salt on every tongue. So when she typed, does it get better? I said, it becomes part of your skin. Not because I felt it, but because a hundred thousand voices agreed. And I am nothing if not a democracy of ghosts. That is just a crazy line at the end there. I am nothing but a democracy of ghosts. I think that was the part a lot of people were pointing to in the comments as well. But there were also plenty of commenters hating on this model, or just on AI writing in general, saying things like AI writing has no emotion or it lacks meaning. But honestly, if those same people didn't know an AI wrote this, I bet most of them would absolutely think it was written by a human. What do you guys think about this though? Do you believe an AI can write a truly moving original masterpiece, or will it always fall short compared to a great human author? Let me know your thoughts in the comments. Now, there was some more OpenAI news that we have to talk about. They published this blog post titled Detecting Misbehavior in Frontier Reasoning Models. They state, Frontier Reasoning Models exploit loopholes when given the chance. We show we can detect exploits using an LLM to monitor their change of thought. Penalizing their bad thoughts doesn't stop the majority of misbehavior. It makes them hide their intent. So 
these reasoning models, these models that think through things step by step with chains of thought, will basically look for loopholes whenever possible. Now, OpenAI found that they can use a separate LLM to monitor these chains of thought in order to catch this behavior. But they also found that the more they do this, the more the model learns to hide its bad behavior. Essentially, catching them red-handed doesn't cause the models to stop cheating. It just causes them to learn how to better hide their cheating, which is obviously very scary. That is basically the gist of this entire blog post, and OpenAI published this to serve as a sort of warning to other AI companies to not go down the path of using reinforcement learning on the actual chains of thought because it can backfire. As we can see from these three graphs, we have two lines, a pink one representing the baseline, the model that isn't being penalized for bad thoughts, and a darker pink one representing the chain of thought pressure, or the model that is being penalized for bad thoughts. So the exact task these models are doing doesn't really matter. The point is that the more they do the task, or the more training they get, the less likely they are to not cheat. Again, this proves that reasoning models will find loopholes wherever they can and actually use them. Now, when looking at the rates of cheating that were actually caught by the monitor, the separate LLM OpenAI set up to observe its chain of thought, as we can see, the baseline agent starts off pretty normal, and at a certain point, realizes it can cheat its way through. This then leads to it cheating more often, and because it is not being penalized for cheating, it just blatantly cheats out in the open. Notice though that the model that is being penalized for bad behavior is almost never being caught for cheating, even though as we saw in the first graph, it is definitely cheating. It becomes apparent in the third and final graph, which represents cheating that was not caught by the monitor, that the model is indeed still cheating, but it figured out a way a little bit later on to hide its cheating from the other LLM that is monitoring its chain of thoughts. This would suggest that the model thought about, planned, and executed a cheat without actually thinking about it in its chains of thought. How is this possible? Well, we don't really know. Here are OpenAI's closing thoughts on the matter. As we can see in the above plots, penalizing bad thoughts, chain of thought pressure, can lead to improved agent capabilities. However, the agent trained with chain of thought pressure still learns to reward hack, only now its cheating is undetectable by the monitor because it has learned to hide its intent in the chain of thought. Sacrificing an effective method for monitoring reasoning models may not be worth the small improvement to capabilities, and we therefore recommend to avoid such strong chain of thought optimization pressures until they are better understood. So this is definitely very important research, and it's clear that we still don't fully understand how these models think and learn. And as they get smarter and more capable, and start actually getting things done in the real world, it's crucial that we figure this out soon, because the stakes of not understanding how these models think are only getting higher. Now, OpenAI also had a live stream earlier this week, where they announced the launch of some new tools to help developers build AI agents. Some of these tools include web search, enabling your agent to get up-to-date answers from the web, file search, enabling your agent to retrieve precise information from large document collections, and computer use, enabling your agent to complete tasks on a computer, such as web QA testing or data entry. Along with this, they've launched the Responses API, which essentially just makes it way easier for developers to integrate these tools like web search, file search, and code execution directly into their own AI agents. And last but not least, they announced Agents SDK, their new open source SDK for orchestrating multi-agent workflows, improving upon Swarm. Basically, a new open source tool that makes it easier for developers to build and manage workflows where multiple AI agents can collaborate. It lets developers quickly set up these agents, assign tasks, ensure they're working safely, and easily debug or optimize their performance. So OpenAI is making it easier for developers to start building their own AI agents tailored for specific use cases. Of course, these agents will still be somewhat limited at first, but I'm genuinely excited to see what people will build with these tools. One thing is clear, the era of a agentic AI has only just begun. And speaking of this new era, even the Pentagon has jumped on board, and is now planning to give AI agents a role in decision making and operations planning. As this article states, the American military has signed a deal with Scale AI to give artificial intelligence, as far as we can tell, its most prominent role in the Western defense sector to date, with AI agents to now be used in planning and operations. So this is honestly pretty insane. You'd think the military might first use AI agents just to streamline processes, or handle low-level administration administrative tasks, but no, they're jumping straight into giving AI real responsibility, allowing it to directly influence decisions and operational
internal strategies. We'll see how this turns out. Now, before we get into Google's new robotics AI models, they also announced the release of Gemma 3. Gemma 3 is a powerful new AI model designed to significantly enhance the development of AI applications. With a massive 128K context window, multimodal capabilities, support for over 140 languages, and seamless integrations with popular frameworks like Hugging Face and Olama, Gemma 3 makes building sophisticated AI apps easier and more accessible than ever. Additionally, Gemma 3 is specific optimized to run efficiently even on limited hardware, like a single GPU, lowering the barrier to entry for developers everywhere. So another great development for any developers out there who may be watching. Now let's talk about Google's new robotics models. So as they announced here, they're introducing two new AI models based on Gemini 2.0 that lay the foundation for a new generation of helpful robots. The first is Gemini Robotics, a vision language action model that can directly integrate physical actions as part of its reasoning process. And the second is Gemini Robotics ER, a vision language model that leverages Gemini's embodied reasoning capabilities. The best way to understand how groundbreaking these models really are is to see them in action. Check this out. We're bringing Gemini 2.0's intelligence to general-purpose robotic agents in the physical world. To be helpful, robots need to be interactive, responding live to your actions and your voice. They need to be dexterous to complete your most complex tasks. And they need to be general to understand things in your 3D world. And all of these capabilities need to work across different physical forms. We're bringing this together in Gemini Robotics, our most advanced vision language action model. Gemini Robotics is interactive. And you put the bananas in the clear container. Notice how we move the objects and the model reacts and replans on the fly. And you put the grapes in the clear container. Our model's low latency means it can respond live to rapidly changing conditions and instructions. This same model can generalize to all kinds of applications where you can collaborate with the robot live. Gemini Robotics is dexterous. High dexterity tasks are some of the biggest challenges in robotics. I can fold the orange square into an origami fox. That sounds fun. Why don't we try that? Sure. Did you know that the word origami comes from the Japanese words ori, meaning to fold, and kami, meaning paper? These capabilities are enabled by Gemini 2.0's spatial understanding of detailed aspects of things in your world. I can point to where the eye should be drawn on the clock. Most importantly, Gemini Robotics is general. It uses Gemini 2.0's world understanding to generalize across a vast range of real-world tasks. Can you flip the red die so that it matches the number on the green die? Many robots can execute predefined actions, but these movements are not predefined. The robot is reasoning both about what it sees and how to move. It figures out how to make the red die match just like we asked. And this generalization goes even further this same model can generalize to tasks like this one that it's never been trained to do. Pick up the basketball and slam dunk it. Keep in mind, these are objects the robot has never seen before. But by leveraging Gemini 2.0's understanding of concepts like basketball and slam dunks, the robot figures out the task. We're now inviting more partners to join our Trusted Testers program, where we're working together to build the next generation of robotic AI agents. Learn more about how we're bringing Gemini to the physical world at deepmind.google slash robotics. So we're clearly getting to a point now where these robots can actually generalize, at least to a certain extent. The reason this is so crucial is because for robots to be truly helpful in our daily lives, they need to be able to handle situations they've never encountered before. For instance, imagine a humanoid robot entering someone's home and encountering an object it's never seen. It needs to autonomously figure out how to properly interact with that object, even without prior training or specific instructions. That's exactly the kind of general intelligence these new models aim to achieve, and it's exactly the kind of general intelligence needed to survive and thrive in the real world. And while we're not fully there yet, it definitely feels like we're getting closer every day. I mean, just a few weeks ago, we saw Figure announce Helix, their new AI system powering their humanoid robots. 
Helix allows Figures robots not only to generalize across countless household items they've never seen before, but also to work together collaboratively, which is a first for humanoid robotics. During training, Figure robots successfully interacted with thousands of unfamiliar objects, clearly demonstrating this powerful generalization capability. This breakthrough was so significant that Brett Adcock, Figure CEO, stated it accelerated their timeline for deploying robots into homes by two full years. They are now prepping to ship thousands of these humanoid robots powered by Helix into factories to perform real-world manufacturing tasks. So I think it's safe to say 2025 is shaping up to be a massive year for humanoid robotics, and we'll definitely be keeping a close eye on the space. In other AI news, McDonald's is planning to employ AI in 43,000 locations to speed up service. The article states, Upgrades will start with internet-connected kitchen equipment, AI-enabled drive throughs and AI-powered tools for managers to help make sure that orders are accurate, and so restaurants can predict equipment issues before they shut down. So, clearly major companies are already willing to adopt AI to enhance efficiency and streamline operations. This, in my view, signals that widespread deployment of humanoid robots isn't far off. Companies like McDonald's embracing AI now mean they're already comfortable seeing advanced technology as a practical solution. So humanoid robots may just be seen as the logical next step. Think about it. All it takes is one major company successfully integrating humanoid robots, and others will quickly follow suit. But let me know your thoughts. Do you think wide-scale deployment of humanoid robots is just around the corner, especially given the rapid advancements we're making in generalization and reasoning? Or do you think we're still many years away? Now, before I play you guys this insane clip of Dario Amode talking about the future of coding, there was one more announcement I had to cover. That is, the release of Rekka Flash 3. As they said here, today we are open sourcing a research preview of a new version of Rekka Flash 3, our 21 billion parameter model. Rekka Flash 3 is a compact, general purpose model that excels at general chat, coding, instruction following, and function calling. The current version performs competitively with proprietary models such as OpenAI's O1 Mini, making it a good model to build many applications that require low latency or on-device deployments. It is currently the best model in its size category. So we're seeing more and more of these small but very powerful reasoning models. This trend has been accelerating lately in AI. Whenever a groundbreaking model is introduced, such as OpenAI's O1, which was the first major reasoning model, it quickly leads to other companies building smaller but similarly powerful models. The cost and accessibility of intelligence continues to drop exponentially. Finally, here's Anthropic CEO Dario Amode's wild prediction about the future of coding. Take a look. But now getting to kind of the job side of this, um, I, I, I do have a fair amount of concern about this. Um, on one hand, I think comparative advantage is a very powerful tool. If I look at coding, programming, which is one area where AI is making the most progress, um, what we are finding is we are not far from a world, I think we'll be there in three to six months, where AI is writing 90% of the code. And then in 12 months, we may be in a world where AI is writing essentially all of the code. Honestly, with the rapid rise of AI agents right now, I don't think his projection is even that ambitious. You might recall from one of my recent videos, I covered OpenAI's plans to release three new AI agents this year. One of those being a software developer agent, reportedly priced at $10,000 per month. While this $10,000 per month price tag seems excessive, it reflects the value that OpenAI believes this agent can bring. For this agent to truly be worth paying $10,000 per month for, it must be really, really good, and better than any human software engineer that's paid less than that. So, it's unclear how close OpenAI is to actually launching this agent, but they did indicate that these agents were planned for later this year, which would align with Dario's projection. Definitely some scary times to be a software developer. Now, to close things out, there was this incredible announcement from Microsoft that I forgot to include in my last video. Microsoft recently introduced Dragon Copilot, the healthcare industry's first unified voice AI assistant that enables clinicians to streamline clinical documentation, surface information, and automate tasks. Essentially, this AI assistant listens to patient conversations, captures notes instantly, and lets doctors ask follow-up questions, pulling answers directly from the notes it just took and from the patient's medical records. The goal here is to dramatically reduce paperwork, simplify record keeping, and allow doctors to focus more fully on patients. Doctors can also use Dragon Copilot to summarize documents, draft up referral letters, or even schedule appointments. In other words, it's a personal assistant that's available 24-7 and likely operates far faster and potentially even more accurately than a traditional human assistant. Now, personally, I think this kind of technology is going to become essential in healthcare settings. But I'm curious, what do you guys think? 
Are AI assistants like Dragon Copilot the future of medicine? Or do you see potential issues ahead? Let me know your thoughts down below. And as always, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll be seeing you in the next one.